This is entitled, The First Message and the Manifesto. Good morning, everyone. When we say the first message, we mean chronologically, but also first in importance, as we hope to show as we go along. Would you open your Bibles, please, at Matthew chapter 3? Chapter 3. Let us notice Matthew's method. In verse 1 he says, In those days cometh John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And then in verse 13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John. First John came preaching, then after that cometh Jesus. So it would be sensible, it seems to me, to follow the pattern which Matthew sets so that by that may, means we may be able to understand better the coming of the Messiah into public life. So let's first of all look briefly at the forerunner, because that is what Matthew does. Notice in verse 2 the message of John then. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in verse 8, Bring forth, therefore, fruit worthy of repentance. Now we must understand, brethren and sisters, that John Baptist is a realist. He had learned in the desert the reality of true religion. He, he had learned that it is reality that lies at the root of, of, of all religious life. And so to a nation of formalists, he came uh, preaching that they must be real, uh, personal reformation is required in preparation for the kingdom of heaven. And, and from Luke's record, we learn uh, just how practical the message was. Let each man do his duty. Let uh, the rich give to the poor. Let the publican accuse no man falsely. Let the soldier be content with his wages. Uh, change yourselves, he's saying, else you will have no kingdom at all. And he delivered his message manfully, and his success was astonishing, even to himself. He was a burning and a shining light, and he shined and burned his way into the hearts of the Israelites. And the desert swarmed with people. The formalist was satisfied no longer with his formalism. And the unbeliever could rest no longer in his infidelity. They said, what must we do? And the answer, as we've seen, was practical. Comfort the bereft. Feed the starving. So let us mark the message carefully. Though he was a hermit, this John, he took no hermit's view of men and things. There was, there was nothing morbid in, in his call to, to, to the nation. Repent with him didn't mean come with me and into the wilderness and live away from the world. Didn't mean that. It meant the opposite in a way. Go back to the world, he said, and, and live your lives uh, truly go back to the world and uh, do your worldly duty in an unworldly spirit uh, and the result of, of his preaching was was remarkable men of the world hard men cynical men coming with reverence to learn the true duty of an active life in a busy world from a man who'd lived all his life in the desert in a way a contradiction what was the secret then of John's success this voice crying in the wilderness. Now, as it appears to me, um, one strong reason for his success was that men in Israel then felt that John was real. They knew it would be no good going to John uh, in order to get some learned subtlety, some, some piece of sophistry, like they would go to the rabbis and, and, and the scribes. His words were real and it touched them powerfully. Repent, he said. Wrath to come, he said. The axe is laid at the root, he said. Fruitless trees will be cast into the fire, he said. He preached as men preach in earnest. They may not have liked it, but they were compelled to listen and they could not escape its realism. So I think they felt, come what may, this John was true. He had the power of confronting each man's life with the 
awful truth about its shallowness. And so the poor looked wistfully for some solace and salvation. The soldiers reverenced John's heroism. The guilty publicans came for purification of heart and the self-satisfied formalist is uh, ready to confess his shallowness and the calm reasoning infidel is um, ready to shed his scepticism because of John Baptist. Now just recollect, brothers and sisters, John's reaction to this success um, and in particular his reaction to two classes that came to him. Those, those two classes I've just mentioned last, the, the formalist and the sceptic. He said, Who hath warned ye to flee from the wrath to come? Even John marvelled that such as these uh, had responded to his call. And it's interesting to notice this. Perhaps, um, after all, um, their religion had no real conviction. Perhaps, after all, it is an empty show. Formalism can never really satisfy truly the man who is seeking God, nor can scepticism give any true rest to the troubled spirit. The formalist's heart, perhaps, after all, is... Um, polluted and miserable and the infidel perhaps after all um, is not so sure and not so certain perhaps in his heart he is restless and he is dark and he is desolate now why do I say that? well ask yourself think about it yourself why are these people why are these men trembling on the brink of Jordan? Perhaps inferentially they are telling us something. It could well be they are telling us something as they wait there on the bank of John's river. Perhaps they are saying, it is a lie. It is a lie. We are not happy. We are dark and we are hopeless and we are miserable. Now Matthew finds his Hebrew justification for the mission of John... Um, John the Herald in the 40th chapter of Isaiah so will you just have a look at that with me the famous 40th chapter of Isaiah Isaiah 40 verse 1 comfort ye comfort ye my people set your guard speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished that her iniquity is pardoned and that she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one that crieth, Prepare ye in the wilderness the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now, the, the implication of that is, is incisive. Um, the one whom I, Isaiah describes is about to appear. And, and, and by the mystery of the Holy Spirit, Isaiah had heard, as it were, in advance, the voice of John crying in the wilderness. But very soon, um, Isaiah will move from from the herald to the herald's king in, in a couple of chapters in chapter 42 behold my servant mine elect in whom my soul delighteth he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he hath set judgment in the earth Isaiah tells what the outcome will be you notice every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places shall be made plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together in other words the kingdom of heaven is at hand I think do you not think too that surely Matthew must uh, uh, meant us to understand this when he hovered, as it were, over the prophet's reference to this voice in the wilderness. And finally, notice how Matthew tells us what the coming one was to be like through the selective words of John the Herald. He, he says he will destroy and he will build this Messiah. He will break 
and he will heal. John says he will cleanse the threshing floor. He is a man with a fan and he is a man with unquenchable fire. The axe is ready and the workman is strong. The fano is winnowing and the fire will purify. Notice the blessing. He shall gather his wheat into the garner. We could, we could let our imagination interpret the testimony of John when you think of those words that he spoke about him. He is telling us that this Messiah will not make truce with the things in any man's life which are in opposition to the purity of God. Later on in the 10th chapter of Matthew there is a record of the man of Nazareth saying, I came not to bring peace but a sword. And he will not come this Messiah and temporize with evil. He is at war with the forces which contradict the divine ideal of peace whether it's in a man's soul or whether it's in the world. He is at war with pride and greed and inflated self-importance. He is at war with all those forces which hurt and harm humanity. As you hear the word of John about this Messiah, he will, he will throughly purge the threshing floor. Know this, therefore, that he is at war with all the forces which thrive upon fear. He is at war with the jackboot and the torturers. He is at war with, with the forces which serve... Um, which starve and which murder. So we can say, thank God that his enemies will lick the dust. Thank God that he is a garnering Messiah. He will gather the wheat into the garner, said John. Isaiah says, of Yahweh's servant, the anointed one, I have called thee in righteousness and I will hold thy hand and will keep thee and give thee for the covenant of the people and for a light of the Gentiles to open the blind eyes to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon and to them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. And then finally let us mark one thing that John says about the Messiah. He that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. What, what a splendid epilogue to the testimony of John about the anointed one. Jesus once said of John that he was the greatest born of women. And John says about Jesus that he's not, he was not worthy to undo the latchet of Jesus' shoe. So no wonder it is recorded by the Hebrew man let all the angels of God worship him. Now let us notice the first word in verse 13 of chapter 3 of Matthew's Gospel. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee. The word then means at that time, that particular time, the time when John had cried and stirred the nation and had prepared the way, when John had done his work, then cometh Jesus from Galilee. Now we cannot dwell very long, brethren and sisters, upon the baptism of Jesus, but at the same time, we cannot pass it by. The main question that ought to interest us, I think, is why did it happen? Now, measured by human judgment, you see, it is a contradiction. The baptism of John was a baptism of repentance. And Jesus had nothing to repent of. He was sinless. Now, rude people might say, therefore, it was just a performance and nothing else. An empty show. There he was, the Messiah, the sinless one among the sinful, the Prince of Life among the dead, submitting to baptism as a sign of repentance. Even John was surprised. It had been, if it had been left to John, he would have said, no, never. The justification for the baptism is focused in the words of Jesus. Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. There is no need to dilly-dally over this. As it appears to me, this is why it happened. What Jesus meant by fulfilling all righteousness. He was sinless. Yes, he was sinless. He had no need of repentance. Not one whit. But notwithstanding that, he did it to identify himself with those who are sin-stricken and those who are in need of redemption. It was an act to associate himself with his great mission. If the Messiah 
was intended to be just an exemplar, an example to us of a good life. If he was just that, then of course the baptism was pointless. But he is not just an exemplar, he is a redeemer. The redeemer is identified with the redeemed. The sinless is identified with the sinful. There is a sentence in Isaiah 53 which I think may illuminate this baptism. The sentence is, he was numbered with the transgressors. Now I know we usually think of that as referring, as it certainly does, to his death. But may not it also refer to his baptism? He was numbered with the transgressors. The baptism, in a sense, was the beginning of the process which led to the cross. It was a prophecy, in a way, of his final baptism, the baptism of blood. And so he identifies himself with the people that he is to save and the people over whom eventually he is to reign. Paul says he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. And is not baptism a sign of death? Later on he is going to say, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how am I straightened until it be accomplished? So before the world, in the sight of all men, at his baptism he consecrates himself to that righteousness which will dominate his life and which at last will bring him to the cross. So John says, in this very context, as he is baptized, John cries, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You see, a man cannot gather and a man cannot garner until he gives himself away. That's a great principle which he himself enunciated. He who loses his life shall gain it. And so he renounces in this immersion, in the presence of John, he renounces the sin which he has renounced all his life and which he will conquer. And that the baptism was right, there can be no doubt. There are two things which prove it. First of all, the Holy Spirit descends. The Holy Spirit descends in rich effusion upon him. The power and the light of heaven floods into his soul. And then, the voice of God. If you listen carefully, my comrades, if you listen carefully, you can hear the note of contentment in the voice from heaven. You see, this is the voice of the God who rested after his great creative work. He rested when he had completed it. When he said it is very good, he rested. But his rest was short-lived. The rest of God was soon disturbed by the rebellion of men. And then the prophet said this God who rested was rising early. And sending his prophets. But now there is a note of contentment in the voice of God from heaven. This is my beloved, my son, in whom I am well pleased. Eighteen years of dedicated life at Nazareth has been given divine approbation. And let us mark the word carefully. The Father is well pleased. It means that the carpenter is anointed to be the Lord's Christ. Now the other thing to notice is the dove. Matthew is revealing the Messiah to the Hebrews. And there were two things in the Hebrew mind which stood markedly for sacrifice. The lamb and the dove. In the baptism he has consented to death for the saving of men from their sin. And the dove, as you know, was the sacrifice for sin offered by those who are the poorest and the humblest. Now these things are significant. These things, in a way, are not idle things. They are important things. They tell and foretell the deep things of this man's high calling. Listen to this, Christ, through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish unto God. We can begin to understand, therefore, why 
years before the psalmist has said has given us the voice of God yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion if you are listening you can detect the note of contentment in the voice of God let us come now to verse 12 of Matthew chapter 4 Verse 12 of Matthew 4. Now when he had heard that John was delivered up, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, toward the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light and to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death to them did light spring up. Now what an interesting thing brethren and sisters. Jesus had lived at Nazareth for 30 years and then quite suddenly he leaves Nazareth altogether and took up his residence in Capernaum. He did this when John was imprisoned. Once again, Matthew takes us to the Old Testament, as we've just seen, by way of explanation. He says the action was in fulfilment of Isaiah the prophet. The passage quoted is right at the start of that chapter we've already pondered, where the child is celebrated in those four wonderful couplets. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, I bring you back once more to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, the first two verses. But there shall be no gloom in her that was in anguish. In former times he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time which he hath made in the, but in the latter time hath he made it glorious by way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people that walk head in darkness have seen a great light. And they that dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. I am told by those who understand these things better than I do, that the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali was the land that suffered most of all from the invasion by the Assyrians and therefore it was regarded as being the most degraded part of all Israel because of its contamination from Gentile influence and from Gentile presence. So we'll notice it is called Galilee of the Gentiles. In a sense that was a term of disgust a term of despising. I have read, I have read that because of this degradation it was actually known by the Jews as the region and the shadow of death. In the heart of it, right in the heart of it was Capernaum by the seaside. It came to be known as his own city here he found the man who wrote this gospel. The point is that here at Capernaum he went deliberately to begin his public ministry. He began, you see, at the worst place. The place of the deepest darkness. That's where he began. The lowest place. That's where he began. Literally and spiritually, the lowest place. The despised place. The place of degradation. The place where people walk in darkness. It was, it was there that the great light first shone forth. The wonder, you see, the wonder is that Isaiah had seen it hundreds of years before he had seen it. He said, to them that sit in the region and the shadow of death, to them did the light spring up. This is where the first message was proclaimed. Notice what it was. Matthew 4 verse 17. 
From that time began Jesus to preach and to say, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, the words are familiar, are they not? You've heard them before. We heard them first from the lips of John Baptist. The very same message, John and Jesus. Now, I am going to say something to you which might be regarded as controversial. I hope you won't be mind, I hope you won't mind that. I hope I shan't get into trouble. I'm going to say something to you which is controversial. And you may disagree with it profoundly. Although the cry was the same as the cry of John Baptist, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Although the cry was the same, there is a difference between the message of John and the message of Jesus. And what I mean is this. John said, Repent ye and prepare yourselves for the way of the Lord. He said, Change your conduct. He said, Stop your dishonesty. Stop your greed. Stop your exclusivism. He put his finger on their wickedness and he said, Stop it. Change your life. Change your doings. And the king came and said, Repent ye. And he meant also, Change your conduct. But I am saying to you, it was different. It was deeper. It was more incisive. He faced men squarely and said that they were wrong, not only in their conduct, but they were wrong in their consciousness. They were wrong in their thinking. They were wrong in their minds. In the very centre of their lives, they were wrong. Get right in your life, he said. This was utterly radical. It was, it was a revolution. But it is fundamental. It is essential. A man's consciousness regulates his conduct and his conduct formulates his character. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The implication. You cannot change the centre by tinkering with the circumference. A man's heart is not changed by renovating the externalities. How you are in your consciousness conditions how you behave and how you behave makes you eventually what you are in your character. Well, you can put it to the test. If you believe truly in the kingdom of God, you will know that this life is not the real life for the disciples of the king. You will know that. If you believe truly in the kingdom of God, you will know that this is not your real life. You will know that your real vocation is going to begin in the age to come and that now you are but pilgrims here um, um, looking onward to your true destiny and to your true life. If you believe that with all your heart, it will condition your attitude to the present life. If you really believe you are a pilgrim, you will not be, you will not be obsessed with the pursuit of pleasure, with the gaining of worldly wisdom and worldly wealth and with the acquisition of things. You will not be consumed with that. Because you are only here on probation, you will handle these things with light hands and um, you will um, understand them rightly. You will not be consumed by rank or, or status or, or pleasure or possessions. You will use them perhaps, but you will have them in the right perspective. And this happens because of what you believe about the kingdom of God. Other men will say that you are mad. Of course they will. That's what they say about us sometimes. They will say you are mad. But you know that it is a madness which rightly named is the sublimest sanity. So this is what I mean then. What you believe in your deepest heart is vital. And this, I believe, was the message of, of the king. The word repent from his lips um, passes into its deepest meaning um, and touches a man's, uh, the, the things of a, of a man's fundamental faith. It, it gets right to the centre of things. When in a minute we, we come to look at the manifesto, we shall find that this is confirmed. But, but for now, just let's mark the reason for the repentance. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now I realise, brethren and sisters, um, 
with this audience there is no need whatever for me to explain the meaning of that sentence the kingdom of heaven is at hand but for the sake of any who may uh, listen to the tape which you know and I know is being made and perhaps they will not have a clear conception or at least not a as clear a conception of its meaning as you have will you therefore hear me patiently just for a moment um, the kingdom of heaven is the Hebrew way of referring to the rule of heaven upon earth that is to say the kingdom of God it occurs mostly in the gospel of Matthew because he is writing especially to the Hebrew nation it is not the kingdom of earth not the kingdom of earth that would be a travesty of its meaning it is on earth but it is the rule of heaven the rule of the most high over the affairs of men now Jesus said that because of the kingdom of heaven men should change their minds they should change their conduct and they should change their character they must now enthrone God in their lives they must bow the knee at his throne they must kiss the scepter of his rule they must swear their allegiance to his government for the sake of any who are not sure it means the rule of the king upon earth uh, administering the sovereignty of God over all people the kingdom of God the prophets had all testified to the abiding fact of this kingdom that one day it would be established upon the earth and it would never be destroyed men sing in hope and they wait in agony and they cry in despair and what they need if they don't know it what they need is the coming of the king to establish upon the earth the government of God. Now this is what is meant by the words the kingdom of heaven. Jesus made it plain in the pattern prayer thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All heaven let loose on earth. But here is the mystery and now we come back to a study. Here is the mystery. Jesus said it was at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, there's no need for us to beat about the bush while there isn't time. Um, it was at hand because the king himself was in their midst. That is what he meant by the kingdom of God is within you. That is a very bad translation, really. What he said was the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. What he meant was accept me as your king and you have come close to citizenship. Obey me, eventually, obey, me, obey me and eventually the doors of the kingdom will be opened to you. Submit to my commands and you have grasped the very values of my kingdom. It's by way of the king that men will come at last to the kingdom. Indeed, this is how the prophets saw it. They looked with wistful eyes um, uh, from the mountain tops and told of the coming of the child. Didn't they? The son. The government, they say, the government would be upon his shoulder. They called him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This was the child in his maturity. And the result, well, you know the result, it's the master passion of your faith of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this thus those who came to understand what this meant knew that when the king stood among the people of God in the land of Israel the kingdom of heaven was at hand come now to Matthew chapter 5 Matthew chapter 5 and seeing the multitudes he went up into the mountain and when he sat down his, his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them now we call it 
or sometimes it is called the Sermon on the Mount I call it his manifesto have you ever met people brethren and sisters who say to us we do not care for your statement of faith you Christadelphians no we do not care for your statement of faith we do not like your strong doctrinal attitude we do not care very much for your defined dogmas nor for your formulated tenets we do not like this all we want is the Sermon on the Mount thank you as though to say your doctrine is complicated and controversial and difficult but give us the Sermon on the Mount because that is straightforward and clear and without dispute all we want is the Sermon on the Mount does that make you smile? go on smile it ought to make you smile all we want is the Sermon on the Mount God help us is there anything more difficult than the Sermon on the Mount? Is there anything more likely to turn you inside out than the Sermon on the Mount? Is there any, any more radical declaration in the Bible than the Sermon on the Mount? All we want is the Sermon on the Mount. I would have thought that if we are looking for quietness as these people probably are and if we're looking for non-complication and if we're looking for a nice comfortable religion and if we're looking for easy living without being disturbed very much then the very last thing we want is the Sermon on the Mount remember think of this when you are reproached and persecuted and vilified rejoice and be exceeding glad everyone that looketh on a woman with lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart if thy right eye causeth thee to stumble pluck it out and if thy right hand causeth thee to stumble cut it off I say unto thee resist not evil but whosoever smiteth thee on the right cheek turn to him also the other if any man take thy coat give him thy cloak also whosoever compelleth thee to go a mile go with him twain Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not away. I say unto thee, love your enemies, pray for them that despitefully use you. Judge not that ye be ju judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged as well. And ye shall be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. God help us. All we want is the Sermon on the Mount. I tell you something, if you want revolution, then what you want is the Sermon on the Mount. Revolution, that's what it is. The king says that the blessed people are those who are poor, who mourn, who are meek, who are hunger and thirst, who are merciful, who are pure in heart, who are peacemakers and who are persecuted. They're the blessed people. All we want is the Sermon on the Mount. It's utterly radical and it is outrageous. It is the king's manifesto and measured by human measurement it is a receipt for failure. Why is it so radical, brethren and sisters? So, so heart-searching, so, so scorching. Why is it? Because of something we've marked already. It seeks to touch men at the very centre of things, that's why. It searches the internal, that's why. It changes the heart, that's why. Never mind about adultery in a dark place, done furtively in secret. Never mind about that. That's bad enough, but never mind. Listen to this. What about adultery committed in the heart and in the mind? Does that make you shudder? Or have you ever said quietly to yourself, would it not be better if this standard were a little lower? Wouldn't it suit us better? 
Think of this. Ye shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So we sometimes say to ourselves, well, I mustn't put my judgment upon you. I confess, I've sometimes said to myself, um, when I've read that, in the compass of perfection, is there not something that we might call the middle range that suits me well? The middle range. I'm more comfortable there. Well, come to Matthew 22 and hear the voice of the king. No, don't, don't bother turning up. I just, you'll know it, you know it. Come to Matthew 22 and hear the, hear the voice of the king to a lawyer. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the great and first commandment. Is that what Jesus said? He did not. He did not say that. This is what he said. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and with thy whole mind. You see, we've got to be, we've got to get down to it for a little bit now. There is a word for the word all and there is a word for the word whole. They're quite separate words and the word that Jesus used was the word whole. Now you say to yourself, this man from Oxford is going mad. He is splitting hairs. Very well, I will defend myself. I'm going to now come to Matthew chapter 3 verse 10. You remember it well. Matthew chapter 3 verse 10, God says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, and prove me now herewith whether saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Now I'm going to ask you to let me read you that sentence from the revised version. Listen carefully. Bring ye the whole tithe into the storehouse. What is the difference between all and the whole? Now the difference is this. The word all is the sum total of the tithes together neatly added up and presented. That is, the sum total externally correct. That's all. The word whole is... The whole tithe is the sum total of the tithes added up. Totally correct. And in addition, the spirit in which they are brought... That's the whole. Because the spirit is an essential part of the offering. The right spirit turns all into the whole. All is quantitative. The whole is qualitative. That is why the manifesto is so radical. That is why the ethic of Jesus is so revolutionary. The Messiah urges perfection because without it men may do the very things which Jesus commands and yet still not have the spirit of the one who commands them. Do you see that? Seeking perfection takes us into the realm of the inward, into the realm of the real, into the realm of the spirit. And to have lowered the standard would have been to have missed the whole purpose of the ethic. So when the king pronounces blessings right at the beginning of the manifesto, notice that no blessing is pronounced upon anyone for having anything or upon anyone for doing anything, but instead every blessing is pronounced upon men for what they are internally and inwardly. Now, let me be careful, my comrades. Uh, um, that is not to deny that there are external actions and external attitudes which are necessary and which reveal the facts of righteousness. I know that, as you know it. But if the heart is wrong, then there is no... You may do right things with a wrong heart. Do you see that? And if that is true, then there is no beatitude because blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. So this is the awful revelation of Matthew's Messiah according to the manifesto. 
It is not the overt act of sin which is supremely to be condemned. That is bad enough. Let me not water it down one whit, but it is not the overt act of sin which is supremely to be condemned, but rather the inner lust which seeks after the sin. It tells that God does not shudder as men shudder. Men shudder at the outward sign of sin. The murderer with the blood on his hands. The adulterer caught in the act. But God is different. God shudders most at those things in a man's soul. Contempt, hatred, envy, lust which presently will express themselves in overt sin and which often is restrained in men only by the lack of opportunity. Some men are good because they can't find the opportunity to be bad. And so this is the lesson. That and which sometimes people are restrained only by the lack of opportunity. So that is why, you see, the manifesto urges perfection upon us. Of course it's too high for us, of course it is. But that's its purpose. Without it, the very deepest things of a man's nature would never be touched. I tell you something, give men the attainable and they will soon be satisfied. Perhaps even boastful. No, the truth is that true men and women are wooed by the ideal. The second best, the, the compromise, the counterfeit, that will never do it. It is the call of the ideal, it's the vision of perfection which drives a man to strive. And so, the great light of the King's Manifesto, this Sermon on the Mount, it, it flashes upon his disciples, and you know and I know it. It's, it's searching, it's revealing, it's, it's shaming, it's incisive. It, it, it blinds us with its intensity but let's understand its purpose let's not be dismayed as I've explained it's there to make us always to strive the Messiah will take the central essential fact of human personality the, the, the mind of man and, and he will link it with the word of God and making our senses keen for the knowledge of his purpose, for the knowledge of his will, step by step he will transfer the desires of the heart and of the mind into incarnation. Perfection is the ideal. It's got to be the ideal. But for those who fall short, as you know, there is mercy and there is compassion. Remember, he, he takes us as we are with the pollution upon us and he makes us at last to be like himself it does not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he appeareth we shall be like him so let us thank God for the loving mercy of Matthew's Messiah Amen.